Live. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining our Enclave webinar on managing lung cancer patients through the COVID-19 pandemic, What to Know. I'm your moderator this evening, Gina Columbus. I'm editorial director for Enclave, and I'm very happy to be with all of you tonight. The mission of this webinar is to provide our listeners with a free form discussion on how you and your colleagues are managing your patients with lung cancer during the COVID-19 pandemic. We will cover a list of topics that each faculty member will go into greater detail on sharing insights from the front lines. As you can see from the slide, we'll be discussing topics centered around the state of COVID-19, symptoms and radiology and diagnosis, risk of patients with lung cancer for COVID-19, mitigating risk for early and late stage patients, and the expanding use of telemedicine. A couple of quick housekeeping notes. If you're listening to this webinar, we encourage you to submit any questions you have, and we will try to answer as many of them as we can during the QA portion of this webinar. Also to expand your video player to full screen, click on the icon on the lower right of the player, hit escape on your keyboard to revert back to the smaller player. So we have a distinguished panel of experts on today's presentation, and I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and give their title and affiliation. Dr. Agarwal. Hi, everyone. I'm Charu Agarwal. I'm the Leslie Heisler Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania's Abramson Cancer Center. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Dr. West. Hi, I'm Jack West. I'm a medical oncologist, associate clinical a uh, professor in medical oncology at City of Hope Cancer Center and the executive director of uh, what's called Access Hope, the remote consult services uh, available there now. Thank you, Dr. West. Uh, Dr. Pennell. Hi, my name is Nate Pennell. I'm a medical thoracic oncologist at the Cleveland Clinic where I'm an associate professor and director of the lung cancer medical oncology program. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Hi, I'm Stephen Liu. I'm a medical oncologist and the director of thoracic oncology and developmental therapeutics at Georgetown University. Great, thank you so much, everyone. We would like to mention that we are planning to make these webcasts a regular occurring series. So anything that's not covered in this discussion can certainly be raised and mentioned in subsequent webcasts. So we have a great deal of material to cover uh, tonight. So let's dive in. To start us off, I'm just gonna provide some very quick numbers on the current state of COVID-19. So as of today, the number of global confirmed COVID-19 cases are over 509,000. The United States officially has the most confirmed cases at 85,356 with 1,246 deaths. Most recently today, the House passed a $2 trillion coronavirus relief bill and has been signed by President Donald Trump as of earlier today. And the United Nations has also uh, issued a COVID-19 global humanitarian response plan. So as part of our new normal, all of us have been encouraging social distancing and staying at home. Unfortunately, as our experts have previously expressed, we know that this is not an option for those among us with serious medical conditions that require urgent attention. COVID-19 has truly impacted everything, including how we manage lung cancer in our patients. With that, I would like to turn it toward one of the first topics of discussion. So Dr. Argawal, how are we defining some of the symptoms of COVID-19? What is diagnosis like? And what do we know from radiologic findings? So we are learning as we are uh, going along and uh, information is coming in from China, from the Wuhan prov province, as well as from uh, our Italian colleagues as they're fighting uh, this epidemic. And clearly this is um, something that's becoming truly international and um, in true pandemic style, we are now dealing with a crisis, not just in New York City, but also uh, in the rest of the country. I think it's especially important for us as lung cancer specialists, as our patients with lung cancer may experience some of the symptoms uh, that COVID-19 patients may otherwise get. So it's sort of important for us to know what symptoms there may be and how we can differentiate and provide the best care for our lung cancer patients. From our understanding from um, the literature that has emerged from China uh, in retrospective series, it seems like fever and high fever seem to seems 
to be the most predominant symptom, followed closely by cough. Now, cough is a very tricky situation because um, most of my patients with lung cancer may have a cough. So we have to use our best clinical judgment in terms of patients' um, to test as well as patients to isolate. Uh, Symptoms can also be very similar to how a pneumonia presents. Um, Lab findings usually reveal a lymphopenia. There's often high LDH, uh, suggesting an acute inflammatory state. What's also emerged over the last few days is this presenting symptom of anosmia, uh, where basically patients or um, individuals suffering from COVID-19 lose their sense of smell in the absence of any other symptoms. So we have to think about fever, anosmia, and not just cough alone, especially as we uh, evaluate our patients with lung cancer. The routine diagnosis is, um, you know, based on this RT-PCR test. Uh, Many of us have heard about the shortage of tests as well as the long turnaround time with testing. Uh, But there is also uh, research showing that CAT scans can actually improve the sensitivity uh, when added to these RT-PCR. And CAT scan findings can be variable, um, but there are certain findings that are emerging that seem to cluster together in patients with COVID-19. And these usually involve uh, findings um, that are usually bilateral in the majority of the patients, but uh, they they are mostly peripheral with ill-defined margins, and sometimes they can be very hard to differentiate uh, from pneumonitis, either immune-related or radiation-related pneumonitis, which is very important for us, and I think something that we will consider and discuss later on in the program. Uh, There are certain centers that are adding CAT scans uh, to RT-PCR screens screening uh, while they're waiting for the test to sort of uh, screen patients that may be high risk for developing pneumonias, et cetera. Uh, So a lot of data is coming in, Gina, um, in terms of how to manage these patients, what symptoms they may have, and how really we can triage our patients with lung cancer. Thank you very much, Dr. Argawal. Uh, Let's turn our focus over to risk. So what are some supportive data that we have that patients with lung cancer are at risk for COVID-19? Dr. Argawal and Dr. West as well, what have you seen? Uh, I'm happy to pick it up here for a bit. Uh, There's information that is starting to come in both from uh, from Wuhan as well as uh, from Italy. And uh, so we're just putting the pieces together from this. And what we're seeing is uh, really a converging view that uh, there is a higher risk in patients with cancer, and that may be for several different reasons. Uh, first, just looking at the evidence, we have uh, data from over 1,500 patients in Wuhan uh, who, uh, when you look at the proportion of patients, uh, 1% had a history of cancer, and that's Uh, more than you would expect to see. Interestingly, uh, there's been an overrepresentation of patients with lung cancer. In this series, it was five of 18 cases or 28%, more than a quarter. Uh, But interestingly, uh, there's many potential issues here. It is not just the existence of them having a cancer, but patients who are coming in Uh, and being potentially exposed to other patients or to healthcare workers who may have uh, be carriers of uh, COVID-19. So 12 of the 18 patients were survivors at this point without evidence of disease uh, from their cancer, but in follow-up. And we also need to bear in mind that that, uh, some of the factors uh, associated that that we are seeing with COVID-19 uh, and cancer may just be associated with uh, things like uh, at more advanced age, having comorbidities, particularly uh, lung cancer, where we know that patients have uh, more chronic respiratory or cardio, uh, cardiac uh, risk. And so some of these uh, severe, significant, uh, and especially pulmonary comorbidities may be predisposing factors as well as the cancer itself. If we can advance to the next slide. Uh, We also have some insight coming out of Italy 
This is uh, just uh, recently published by Onder and colleagues. And this is looking at data just going back a, a week or so, uh, looking at the case fatality rate. Uh, interestingly, here you're seeing a 7.2% mortality in Italy. And that is over threefold higher than was seen in China. Uh, hard to tease apart exactly what the causes may be. And some of this may well be uh, a more advanced age uh, being a risk factor. The density perhaps are one of the issues that's been suggested is that in some, uh, some of the areas with highest death rates, the, the multiple generations living together could be a factor. Uh, but you can see in the, uh, in the chart at the bottom, that there's a lot of patients, particularly in Italy, who are in their 70s and 80s, who represent a very high proportion of that death rate that we're seeing. This doesn't speak to the uh, cancer issue. And if we can advance to the next slide, you'll see really something that suggests that yes, there, there may well be, or there appears to be an association so that in a subset of 355 patients from Italy, who had a more detailed review of their case, just over 20% had active cancer. So this is really a very high proportion. There were not details of this, so it's not clear how much of this is from uh, their underlying cancer being immunosuppressed versus just uh, their comorbidities or coming into uh, the hospital setting or the clinics uh, where they may have much higher levels of exposure to other people. Uh, who themselves uh, may have it. So uh, certainly what we're seeing is converging evidence that having cancer is, a, uh, is associated with an overrepresentation and a higher risk, but that may be from many different factors. Uh, next slide, I'll turn it back over to Charu and, and she can review some of the other data uh, that are coming out of Wuhan as well. Yeah, and you know, I would add that um, the data on cancer patients and COVID is relatively sparse at this time, as uh, Jack pointed out. You know, the number of patients that we have seen um, reported results on remains low, so it's very hard for us to really come up uh, with specific um, guidance on these patients. But uh, last week we saw a report, a research letter in JAMA Oncology, where they looked specifically at 138 patients. Um, in, in a hospital in the Wuhan province uh, in patients that had cancer. And they found um, that these patients were at high risk more uh, because of hospital-associated transmission that was suspected in about 41% of these patients. And just merely being at the hospital was their greatest risk. It wasn't that they were receiving active chemotherapy. In fact, most of these patients were not uh, receiving active chemotherapy Time from first symptom to um, shortness of breath was about five days uh, for these patients. Time from first symptom to admission seems to be about a week. And then time from first symptom to ARDS was eight days. Um, so, you know, we, we do um, understand based on this data that perhaps these patients need to be checked upon frequently because they may you know, develop uh, complications a week into uh, their initial presentation. And if we dive into some other data that are available, which will be, uh, which will appear on the next slide, um, you know, we have, if you look at these 1,500 patients that have identified, you know, with cancer, um, the infection rate seems to be about 0.79%. Uh, about 12 of these, um, or seven out of 12 of these had non-small cell lung cancer, and about five were receiving chemotherapy or radiotherapy at, that, at this time. Uh, the take-home message is that the greatest risk uh, was attributed to being in the hospital or, uh, you know, the frequent hospital visits were increasing uh, the transmission rates here. Thank you, Dr. Argoal. Is there anyone else on the panel that um, would like to have any comments about those data? Yeah, I think the um, one message is, you know, it's hard to know what to take from these small studies. Um, there is a difference in practice in China where patients are predominantly treated in the inpatient setting there as opposed to the outpatient setting in most of um, Europe and the United States. 
So I'm not quite sure if you could extrapolate the risk of people actually coming in and staying in the hospital frequently for treatment versus those coming into a cancer center for a couple of hours every few weeks using proper protective equipment and uh, social distancing. But whether it's truly a higher risk or not, I think we can all agree that our patients with lung cancer are at higher risk of complications if they do get the infection. And so trying to minimize that risk by avoiding um, as much exposure as possible, I think should be a huge priority. Yeah, that's been our interpretation of the data as well. We really don't think it's a biologic difference for patients with cancer. Uh, out of that Wuhan data that, that you presented, Charu, a lot of those patients were survivors who were just coming in for, for routine visits after surgeries. And, and we really think it's, it's, it's our responsibility to try to minimize the exposures. And, and uh, that's been our strategy here. And I would also just make a point that, you know, for a lot of this, these have been the, the early data before we were really implementing social distancing with any rigor. And uh, so I, I think that we will really need to see uh, how this holds up. We're going to obviously get more information. These are very raw, recent results, just representing a few weeks. And these folks in both Wuhan and Italy were really at the the early uh, edge of this uh, compared to what we've been learning and trying to implement. And so we will have a better opportunity to clarify this uh, as we roll out the preventive measures uh, that, that many of us have tried to really jump on and be proactive uh, for our cancer patients. We're gonna talk more about that too. So I will just add one thing that it seems from this da data that uh, patients with lung cancer, especially those that are older than 60 years of age, seem to be at higher mm -hmm. risk for developing pneumonias and developing complications. Now, I don't know if it's just the lung cancer or the underlying comorbidities um, that predispose to that, but you know there is a slightly higher risk for these patients. And I think that's where we can all agree and we are all saying the same thing that we have to really really prevent the exposure for these patients and make sure uh, that we all understand that they're at high risk to begin with. Exactly. I mean, it, it, it's, it's hard to tease apart when you have somebody who's 75 and has significant comorbidities and is coming into the clinic all the time and is immunosuppressed and has an underlying cancer. There's no way to really tease apart which of these factors was the driving point of it, if there's any, or it may be multiple. Thank you, everyone. That's some excellent insight being shared here. Uh, how about mitigating some of this risk? So Dr. Pennell, what are some strategies that um, are being used for early stage patients? Right. I think the, as, as we said, the, the biggest thing is trying to avoid exposing our patients to risk of infection as much as possible. And really what that means is allowing them to um, do what the rest of us are supposed to be doing, which is sheltering in place and not coming out and exposing themselves. Um, and so when we start practically thinking about this, and, and I'm sure my colleagues are all the same way, I have patients calling me every day now asking if they have to come in, can we, can we uh, delay their treatments, uh, uh, or we're calling them to delay their treatments and they're asking, oh my gosh, no, I don't want to delay my treatment. And so it's, it's, it's definitely very practical to think about this. Um, I think one of the biggest messages is we need to make sure the patients don't feel that they're being pushed aside with this. You know, they're not being pushed um, out. We're not going to take their treatment seriously. We're not going to take their cancer seriously. We know that patients with lung cancer have very serious illness that is life-threatening, potentially in the same time frame as um, we're going to be dealing with this pandemic over the, you know, it, it could be as a few months, but I mean, now they're talking 18 months. So there's, there's, um, uh, you really have to take into account the severity of their disease. And the other thing is, I don't think, even though we are coming out, and we'll mention this a little bit later, some of the guidelines that are coming out about what you can do now, what you can avoid, um, that I really don't think you can use a guideline to blanket make a recommendation for every patient. You really have to individualize that, both for uh, the patient situation, what their risk is, and what the risks of, uh, and, and resources are at the place where you're treating them. So if someone has an early stage lung cancer, uh, right now, if you're only having a few cases and the ORs are all empty because they're avoiding um, uh, elective procedures and, you know, it's only a 48-hour stay for a VATS procedure, maybe actually getting them in and out for a surgery right now is not the worst idea. But I think most of the approaches for early stage have really been trying to identify those patients that can delay. 
Okay, how long can you actually safely delay this? And I think this really needs to be, you have to discuss that with the patient, involve them in the decision, and then you really need to be talking to your multidisciplinary team, your surgeons, your radiation oncologists to try to make these decisions. Um, gen in general, guidelines uh, that are rolling out um, for all types of cancer are suggesting lower risk patients. So in lung cancer, that would be those with mostly ground glass nodules uh, or smaller tumors or lower risk tumors such as carcinoids. It may be safe to wait a number of months just because the risk of something bad happening is relatively low. But for those with larger tumors, node positive tumors, you really can't necessarily wait um, to, to treat those because we know that the window of opportunity to treat them is relatively small. And so um, perhaps going to surgery would make sense even if it's higher risk, but um, in some cases uh, it might make sense to give new adjuvant chemotherapy. So if this is a patient you know that they're gonna need adjuvant chemotherapy, if you give new adjuvant chemotherapy, which we know is equally uh, effective, that uh, you might be able to push off surgery for a few months and, and that might get them past the, past the window. But the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, this is not going to go away soon. It's possible that for some places that the peak is going to be, you know, two or three months away. And so pushing someone off two or three months might not actually make them all that much better. So it really is important to, uh, to discuss that. And one other thing, so for the um, high risk patients that you have this discussion about, well, they probably could tolerate surgery, but maybe stereotactic radiation or SBRT is reasonable. Um, this might be pushing people more towards the... Um, you know, the risk of surgery and exposure to something like a shorter course of SBRT in a patient that might otherwise have been um, slightly favoring towards uh, surgery. Um, you guys have any thoughts about, about the early stage patients? Yeah, you know, I, I would say we just don't know. And, and uh, I think it's your point about individualizing is very appropriate because, of course, there are people with much more virulent concerning disease. There's other people who have a slowly growing nodule and uh, we wouldn't want to, you know, it, frankly, for, for some of those patients, the risk of coming in and, 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 and the new potential for complications related to COVID may, may uh, eclipse any risk of delaying for some period of time. My question about neoadjuvant is, is it clearly better to make people immunosuppressed and come in every few weeks mm -hmm. for treatment as opposed to having the surgery right. that uh, could be a kind of one and done? I think also uh, one of the key things that we need to be asking is uh, particularly around adjuvant or maybe later stage is just making sure that the anticipated benefit uh, more than offsets the risks associated with introducing the treatment. I mean, for somebody with a node negative cancer, uh, I, I think many, we always individualize based on the health of the patient and, and many other issues, their ability to tolerate treatment versus the potentially rather modest absolute benefits. And I think we need to weigh in the, the risks of, of COVID uh, to, that to really re-equilibrates the decisions about whether it makes sense to pursue uh, adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy for someone with a, you know, a 4.1 centimeter tumor. No, I completely agree. And there was even a, um, a case uh, someone on Twitter was asking about a, a 1B, but with high risk features. I would say, you know, in this atmosphere, I wouldn't even really offer adjuvant chemo. I, I think most of us shouldn't be offering to 1B patients anyway, but you know, it certainly is a discussion in some patients who have lymphovascular invasion or uh, visceral pleural invasion plus a 1B based on size and, and at least discussing it, I would say at this point, the, the risk probably outweighs the benefits. And as you said, you know, a 4.1 centimeter tumor is a stage 2A, but you know, the, the, the benefit of adjuvant chemo is certainly, um, uh, now that the risk is perhaps higher, uh, might, might change that discussion. On the other hand, we don't want to trivialize stage two and stage three lung cancer. I mean, these patients have more than 50% risk of recurrence, and we know that for higher stage patients, their benefit from adjuvant chemo is real. Um, one of the uh, important things to remember, though, too, is that timing may not be as important for adjuvant chemotherapy as we used to think. So we used to try to give, and actually it's a, it's a ASCO-COPE quality measure to try to give adjuvant chemo within 60 days, but 
In truth, uh, there are some recent publications suggesting that you might be able to get away with significant delays of advent chemo and patients still benefit. Um, and one uh, study, which I think we have on the next slide, um, suggested that patients as late as 127 days or four months after chemo uh, still seemed to get the same survival benefit from chemotherapy. And so someone who has surgery today uh, who might be looking at normally starting four or six weeks from now, I think I would feel very comfortable putting off at least three months before starting on chemo. I think these recommendations are going to vary by region, right? I, I, I think, you know, the um, the critical need for doing uh, a surgery, even for a stage two or stage three lung cancer in New York City may be very different from what it is in Mississippi right now, for example. Uh, but, and, and I think these have to be um, individualized uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And it's so hard to put recommendations around this in a general way. That's a great point, as well as, I mean, there's institutional and regional limitations in the ability to pursue what's called elective surgery. And, you know, lung cancer surgery is generally not that elective. But if you had a, a, a relatively you know, a, a one and a half centimeter growing cancer, uh, you'd really need to factor that in the availability of OR time and ventilators in certain parts of the country is a big issue now. Uh, but you're very right that, you know, it's going to be totally different depending on what the, the rates of infection and the, the medical uh, support and equipment that's available. Uh, I, I've even heard at our institution that, you know, people are concerned about the availability of personal protective equipment and just being able to ensure that, uh, that, that, that is, there's a steady supply when it's needed and, and you need to be judicious about how to prioritize certain, uh, you know, testing and procedures being done just in terms of consuming uh, resources until the supplies are well ramped up. I think lung cancer has always required a multidisciplinary approach, but uh, today with COVID, I think the lines of communication are even more critical and our, our teams really need to speak to each other. And, you know, like you said, Charlie and Jack, a guy, and they, Jack, the guidelines don't really work here because they're going to be different based on, on time and space. Uh, and in New York, if you can't get access to an operating room, then stereotactic radio surgery versus a delay until operating rooms are available may, may very much be, be the best option. No, absolutely. Um, on the other hand, for, for early stage, you know, for example, small cell, if you have someone with a limited small cell, you absolutely don't want to delay uh, in that because uh, we know that the patients have a very short survival without treatment. And so you might want to, you might need to take the risk even of relatively immunosuppressive chemotherapy in that setting. Thank you so much. I think that leads us to um, some later stage disease treatment modifications. Dr. Liu, would you like to start off? Yeah, I think that, you know, when we think about early stage disease, we have lots of different options. We can rearrange treatment. We have different modalities that we can employ for late stage disease. That's a luxury that we often can't afford. Uh, and those patients uh, often need treatment. In, in most of our life, we can delay things for a month or two with some inconvenience, but, but no dire consequence. But uh, lung cancer is not an elective condition. Uh, and this is something that's going to move forward unless we intervene. Uh, and so those delays will lead to worse outcomes and we need to avoid those. And Nate mentioned small cell. I think that uh, on this slide, this is a, a great example. We really are choosing uh, our strategy based on the natural history of this disease. And we would look at a, a metastatic well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor very differently from a high-grade small cell lung cancer. Uh, these are some data from the 1950s that, that are important to keep in mind. These are old VA lung group studies back when we didn't really know if chemotherapy played a role in the treatment of, of lung cancer. Uh, and we, we go back to these data because we have placebo-controlled arms. And in the placebo-controlled arm, we are informed about the natural history. We can see that without treatment, someone with advanced small cell lung cancer would only be expected to survive two to three months. So a delay of one to two months for someone with small cell lung cancer is something that cannot be accommodated. So when we go to the clinic, what are we doing to try to, to mitigate that risk to, to avoid delays, but at the same time reduce uh, exposure? You know, one one question that we asked ourselves is, is about the duration of therapy. So one of the more important uh, treatments that we're using is immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors in the form of PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors. In the advanced setting, we're often giving treatment for a period of two years. Now, those on the call, we, we know that two-year endpoint 
was sort of arbitrary, was somewhat made up. And if we have someone that's at 23 months, um, is that really significantly different from 24 months? In addition, we have some patients at our institution that were on some of the very early trials of checkpoint inhibitors, and they've elected to continue treatment indefinitely. I have people that are four or five years out. Now, six months ago, I think the risk of continuing treatment in that setting was pretty minimal. But today, I would view that through a different lens. I'd say someone that's three or four years out that's had a dramatic response, I'd feel very comfortable uh, holding treatment uh, or maybe even stopping treatment. Uh, Charlie, I'm not sure if your approach has been the same at Penn. Yes, I think for our patients who are on the quote unquote maintenance, right, and who have received or who achieved um, really good clinical benefit or who have stable disease or better, you know, I have certainly have patients that have complete or partial response um, and they've had uh, immunotherapy for several months on board. You know, I feel very comfortable spacing out their infusions or even saying, you know, skip an infusion or two, um, because I feel like their risk of coming into the hospital, their risk of exposure mm -hmm. to healthcare workers, to physicians like myself, who, uh, you know, I could be an asymptomatic carrier, uh, far outweighs the benefit of them receiving an immunotherapy infusion at that time when they, you know, nobody knows how long we need to treat these patients with immunotherapy for. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly talking to my patients. And again, I think this is an an individualized case-by-case -case based decision, right? Um, there's only patients who are early on in their treatment and I'm having discussions with them about the need to come in and at least get their you know, initial chemotherapy to try and get control of disease. But certainly for those patients that are far into treatment and have very good control of their disease, I'm spacing out infusions. Again, not evidence-based, um, but trying to do no harm and trying to do the best for our patients. I think one area where we do have a little bit of evidence is maybe using different dosing schedules. And it's a little bit of an extrapolation. It's not the strongest level of evidence, but um, you know, for, for years we were using nivolumab every two weeks and now we're fairly comfortable with the every three, four week dosing. Uh, I would feel very comfortable with the same with, with several of the other drugs. Dervalumab in, in the maintenance setting uh, for consolidation after chemo immunotherapy, chemo radiation uh, is given at uh, two week intervals. Uh, but you know, we have data from Caspian that show uh, four-week dosing of dervalumab really achieve very comparable, very comparable results. And for atezolizumab, um, used in small cell and non-small cell lung cancer, uh, earlier in 2019, the FDA approved a Q four-week dosing schedule. And so instead of giving the 1,200 milligrams every three, uh, which had been my practice and really no reason to change, now I'm very much leaning on the 1,680 milligrams Q four weeks. Uh, I'm not sure, Jack and Nate, if you guys are doing the same thing. I I, I think that's a very appealing approach. I think. For a very long time, you know, Stephen, you brought up that we have generally kind of ritualized ongoing uh, indefinite maintenance with um, certainly pemetrexid in patients who aren't progressing. And, and as you brought up, uh, pembrolizumab can be routinely two years, and we just haven't known when to stop. We still don't. Uh, and it's just an ongoing debate. Some of the trials, most of the trials stopped at two years, but as you mentioned, we have quite a few patients who have been highly disinclined to stop. And, and frankly, many oncologists who have been disinclined to stop without a clear reason not to. The only thing is I would say, now there's a bit of more of a reason not to, um, besides the, the cost and always some potential for even late cumulative toxicities, um, you know, coming in, regularly is non-trivial at this point. Uh, and, and I think that needs to be weighed into things. I also would say that uh, we should be at least thoughtful talking with our patients about being judicious about giving uh, pemetrexid every three weeks. You know, I know it was in the Paramount trial. There's really no endpoint to it for non-progressing patients or those on, uh, on, uh, uh, Keynote 189, for instance, but, you know, it's not as if three weeks has been truly tested as the best frequency. It's just what was used versus stopping altogether. Um, and there's, there's no clear endpoint. So I think that it is worth talking with the patient. This is a great point for just shared decision-making. Charu's right. We don't, we don't have clear data on this, but we also 
don't have data about what to do in a COVID-19 risk world. And, and we don't have comparative data about giving it every six weeks or uh, stopping for a few months and then resuming for a few cycles. I mean, we just don't know. And there hasn't been that much incentive to look into alternatives. But now I think at the very least, we can present options to, to patients and step back and, and not be dogmatic about it. Because I, I just think some patients are going to uh, maybe have clinical situations that make us more worried or they have their own preferences to keep going no matter what. And others may be far more uh, concerned or it may be a hardship for them. And I think that the COVID-19 potential risk is just one more uh, factor to add into the equation and, and, and uh, consider other options. I think if it leads us to step back and maybe look at some new data, perhaps retrospectively, ideally at some point prospectively, about how much is really needed versus potentially over-treating as ritual, I think that'll be a good development for us in the long, long term. Yeah, to, to be clear, our decisions always start with what is the most effective and the best treatment for the patient. Outside of a COVID world, what is our gold standard, our standard of care? But in many instances, we know that there are comparable options. You know, an, an example might be topotecan. If I'm thinking of using topotecan for relapsed small cell lung cancer, uh, would I prefer the oral regimen instead of the IV regimen? Or would I consider uh, off-label use of something like temozolomide, which is, uh, I think, even better tolerated and, and pretty comparable in terms of efficacy? You know, are we substituting agents that we think are more of a lateral move? We're never going to choose what we think is clearly an inferior treatment, but there's a lot of flexibility, and we have to be somewhat creative with things. Uh, but I mean, bringing up, the, bringing up uh, oral therapies, it, uh, it is when there's an oral therapy that's a comparable choice that doesn't require people coming in, uh, you know, we'd had some discussions about oral etoposide in the setting of, of small cell lung cancer. I mean, it it is used, it is perfectly good. And though it's kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of deprioritized very often in our routine world, uh, there might be very compelling reason to use that as an alternative that keeps a patient from having to come in far more frequently to the clinic at this point. It's just as good. No, I think that's a great idea. Um, I, I typically have not used oral topotecan or oral otoposide for small cell patients, but, uh, but I think now shortening someone from having to come in three days in a row to just doing once uh, with a prescription and take the phase two and three at home makes perfect sense. Um, I, I really like the idea of being able to lengthen out um, our Dervalimab or, you know, um, in Europe, I think they have an approval to give pembrolizumab every six weeks at double the dose as opposed to every three weeks as we give it here. And um, I, I'm, I even put a poll out on Twitter today to try to get some idea of what people are doing with this. And uh, at least in the United States, uh, my, my highly scientific data suggests that more than half of people are not doing that probably mostly because of concerns about reimbursement because those dosing schedules are not reimbursed by the, or at least not approved by the FDA. And so, um, you know, that's always unfortunately something we have to think about. Um, but I think in an ideal world, that would be, that would be a great idea. One of the things we are doing is for people who are doing very well, not having a lot of side effects, we're allowing them to come in and get their treatments without necessarily having to see anyone. So they just kind of duck into the infusion suite for 30 minutes, get their, Tezolism app or whatever they're getting, and then they can go home and we can always talk to them on the phone or with a telemedicine visit, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit more. Yes, thank you. So that perfect segue into our next topic. I uh, definitely want to talk about something that's become all of your new normal is telemedicine. So how are you using this best in practice? Uh, what challenges are you facing day to day? Um, Dr. Orb West, would you like to share your insight? Sure. I, I would say this is this is certainly very dynamic. It's changing all the time. And literally, uh, though I work in remote consults uh, for a, a good amount of what I do, a lot of that's been written. And, and uh, my institution has a uh, partnership with uh, American Well, uh, which is a telemedicine company based in Boston that has had a lot of experience, but I think has been underutilized, even at our institution, has been relatively underutilized until this became a huge catalyst for that. We've seen you know, frantic, really uh, dramatic changes that are still ongoing in 
uh, in billing and, and uh, what, what is defined as legal and appropriate um, at a national level and uh, right in real time at the statewide level. So this is still being hashed out, but our institution is now doing pilots for general clinics that are, uh, that are initiating telemedicine and that's rolling out to the other oncologists at City of Hope in the next couple of weeks. It is something that is not going to be ideal for all patients. Uh, patients are still going to need to come in for their visits, but for a lot of people who are coming in, basically who would be coming in for an in-person discussion uh, as a second opinion, or a routine uh, check-in for targeted therapies and oral treatment, it is absolutely a, a great tool for the job. And I think we're just going to be able to add this uh, right now to the arsenal of, of tools we have available to be able to connect with people in a different way uh, as an alternative to a live visit for people where it's no longer a trivial thing to, to meet up in person, uh, where we're being urged to social distance and stay home as much as possible. Um, but it's something that we're gonna also have to get used to doing. Uh, you know, Most of us have done more conferences like this in the last week or two than we had in the preceding you know, six months. And uh, we've had a lot of time to get used to our bedside manner and train in that we all need to learn website manner now as a as a different approach and and it's going to be a great tool for some people i hope that after uh after this uh these worries die down i hope that happens at some point i hope it's soon but i hope that we will learn from this and continue to use telemedicine. I know I'd seen a, a tweet from Nate a, a couple of weeks ago or a week or two ago saying, uh, use telemedicine here. Why weren't we doing this before? It's not for everybody, uh, not, not for every patient, but I think it's going to be a great tool to add uh, to live visits for some or many patients. Yeah, and I would also add that, you know, nothing like a pandemic to bring change to medicine, right? I mean, it's it's remarkable how quickly we've all adapted um, to telehealth and telemedicine. And Jack, this has been an, an initiative that you've been behind for several years. And, you know, it only took uh, a virus <laughs> to, get, to get a head start on this. But I I'm only joking, but really, I think you're absolutely right, Jack, that, you know, we um, are entering a new era, I think, even after, you know, the pandemic is behind us. Um, I hope that we can, you know, fall back on our skills that we learned during this time uh, to utilize these services uh, to better evaluate patients that may not have the accessibility to come into clinic or, you know, for example, for our clinical trials, for us to be easily able to assess them before they make the two-hour drive to our centers, for example. Right. I mean, yeah. there's just a lot of, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, that it's very routine. We expect patients to drive a long distance and um, you know, particularly for patients who are ill, it can be a hardship. Patients can fly in or drive a long distance for an opinion. And if we can do more of that, I think that that's just going to give us long-term efficiency and patient friendliness that has been long overdue. I was just going to say, I think this is one of the things that's going to be hard to take back. Uh, after things return to normal and we have the option of seeing, is seeing patients in the same way that we're doing now, uh, I think uh, doctors and other practitioners getting used to using telemedicine are really going to appreciate how convenient it is. Um, I see a lot of people who drive from far away, who pay a lot of money to park every time they come. Um, I would say universally, people are loving doing telemedicine that I'm doing right now. And I think it's um, you, you, you lose a little bit of the, of the bond and the patient encounter. I think that's really the biggest thing that is lost, not so much the inability to medically examine the patient, but less of that physical um, uh, presence to, to uh, be able to give them news, whether it be good or bad and whatnot. But uh, for, for the right patient, it's really an ideal 
tool that I, I hope will continue. And we're doing a lot of them now. But I, one point I did want to point out is um, while many types of oncologists are moving very broadly to telemedicine, in my opinion, uh, lung cancer is going to be one of the groups where we're still going to have to have a large number of people coming in in person because most of my patients are advanced patients on active treatment and they, they physically have to come because we can't give their treatments outside the clinic. Um, and so uh, in my, you know, if I'm seeing 15 patients in a day, I, I have maybe four or five of those as a telemedicine visit, but the rest, they have to come. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for such great insight. And um, we're now going to open up the question and answer portion of the webinar. Uh, we do have a lot of questions that came in, which is great. So I'm going to read through some of them and I will just open it up to the floor of uh, whoever would like to answer first. So uh, one of our first questions is, are there any limitations for checkpoint inhibitors for patients with higher risk with COVID-19? So, uh I think we, we really need to, to talk about this because there's no good data on this right now. And uh, I would say that there's just been some anecdotal concern that I've seen from colleagues in, in Italy or other places that have been hard hit that suggest that there may be uh, some association of, of higher risk in patients who are on it. Uh, I've seen a few quotes, uh, a few polls on social media that have people wary about it, but I, I think we're really struggling with this. I would talk with the patient about it, but I just don't think that there are sufficient data, really any good data to, to guide us at this point. And, and I think we need to just weigh that as an unknown or potential risk, but also acknowledge that for many of these patients, it can be a wonderful, highly effective treatment that we wouldn't want to withhold from them. Um, you know, when we, as we talk about surgery or something, this is a treatment that can be incredibly valuable. So I, I think that I wouldn't want to put too fine a point on it at this point, but I'd be cautious. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, it's not so much as starting in immune checkpoint inhibitors, but I, I worry about patients um, that may develop um, pneumonitis or at least radiographic findings that are suggestive of pneumonitis, which may present with some of the symptoms that we talked about, you know, cough, fever, uh, shortness of breath, and, you know, these peripheral ground glass opacities. Um, what to do? Do we treat them with steroids or, you know, avoid steroids because we are trying to prevent complications um, as should be the case in managing the COVID pneumonia. Um, so, you know, I, I struggle more so with those questions than the, the thought of starting immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So I agree with you, Jack, that I think the, the data is very, very limited in terms of starting therapy. But I think as we move into this epidemic in the United States, we are going to be um, wrangling with these questions on almost on a daily basis, especially in our clinic and patients receiving chemo immunotherapy or receiving chemo radiation, you know, are, do they have, you know, do they have the virus? Do they have pneumonitis? It's going to be an interesting next few weeks. I think there's a theoretic risk and one that we'll have to watch very closely. We're, we're very concerned about that, but um, it's a known risk that if I deprive someone with advanced non-small cell lung cancer that doesn't have a driver, if I deprive that patient from, from immunotherapy, from checkpoint inhibitors, the outcomes are worse. And so here it's a setting where, where I really think there is a superior treatment and I'm not really willing to deprive patients to that uh, until we know more. Thank you. Uh, another question that came in is, are there cough quote signatures? Um, that is, can one tell from the sound of a cough whether it's COVID or lung cancer related? No. Oh gosh, I don't know if anyone has any expertise on that. Uh, I think the short answer is probably no. Um, but, uh, you know, a, a new onset cough, one that has not been there before, is always something you need to investigate. Um, I, I, my understanding is that the cough is generally a dry cough, but I think that that's also very common with lots of our patients with lung cancer. So um, you really would, any, any cough in a lung cancer patient, especially now, has to be investigated um, about fevers, about shortness of breath. Um, and uh, other potential risks because patients with lung cancer have so many different reasons to have coughs. They could have pneumonia, they could have uh, just progression of their cancer, they could um, be getting, again, pneumonitis from either a TKI or from their immunotherapy. And so, um, a 
Unfortunately, I, I don't think the character of a cough is all that helpful. Uh, another question that we have is, what do you think about the discordance between CT scans and RT-PCR in the last JAMA oncology study that you discussed? So I wouldn't really call it discordance. I would say that, you know, that there is um, some evidence showing that CAT scans may improve our ability to detect these patients. And, you know, I think it improves the sensitivity uh, above and beyond what we get with RT-PCR. We know that RT-PCR, while a very sensitive test, is not 100%. And also, um, you know, it depends on when you're catching uh, the patient, where they are um, in their incubation period, are they symptomatic, are they not symptomatic. Uh, but they are, you know, the authors were recommending that perhaps CAT scan findings, a few specific CAT scan findings um, can improve the sensitivity of these tests to be able to pinpoint which patients have the disease. We do have some concerns about the false negativity rate with with the PCR test, and um, you know, that we have reports of people using multiple tests and serial tests to really confirm positive cases, and our degree of suspicion has to influence, uh, you know, how much stock we put into a negative test. So that is a concern. These tests were launched pretty quickly, and if you look at the experience in China, the next gen tests were much better than the PCR tests, but you know, we trade off the speed for the, the specificity and sensitivity. Thank you. Um, another question that we have, given the risk associated with hospital visits, what are the implications for lung cancer clinical trials? Uh, many of them are done via infusion in large academic hospital centers. So we've, um, you know, we, we really want to thank the, the sponsors and the FDA and, and the cooperative groups. I think they've really been understanding about this. When we are running clinical trials and all of us do, do that as most of our job, um, we have to follow the protocol very rigidly. We are, uh, you know, have very small windows to perform tests and assessments. Uh, and now, you know, the, the safety of the patient has to come first. And so for someone who's been on an oral therapy for two years, feels great, has been doing well, I normally see them every month, we're doing televisits and simply just mailing them uh, their drug. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll stray a little bit from the protocol, but we explain why. And, and the FDA and the sponsors have been very kind about that. Uh, someone put in a question of how are you addressing lung cancer biopsy needs during COVID-19? We're doing them. I think that, uh, you know, basically what we had discussed that if it is, if it's equivocal, uh, if you have something that is somebody who's getting CAT scans and something has grown from seven to eight millimeters over six months and someone has a PET scan and the SUV is 1.1, I don't think that, I, I think we would not be that enthusiastic about rushing to biopsy that. On the other hand, if someone has a uh, symptomatic growing large, a large uh, or very suspicious lung lesion, it needs to be biopsied, it needs to be treated. Um, and, and we need to move forward. So I, I just think this is one theme that we're getting from this is it's really forcing us to, to ask what truly merits being intervened upon, whether that is a clinic visit, a biopsy, surgery, how long to treat. You know, we are just kind of uh, stripping away the things we do out of reflexive compulsion and ritual and 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 pruning that away but still pulling moving forward with the cases that look like they are very clinically significant and are not just treating a scan one area that i think we we can modify a bit is when we're sending patients back for rebiopsy to get more tissue for molecular testing that's a setting where i think liquid biopsy ct day analysis um, really can be useful in, in avoiding that procedure, offloading the system. And a lot of these um, commercial assays can be done through mobile phlebotomy where the blood tests are even done at home. That's a good, good point. I think if you're in Manhattan right now and you, you know, need to get a bronchoscopy for biopsy, I think you're going to have a lot of trouble finding a pulmonologist and a bronchoscopy suite to get that biopsy. And I, I got to tell you, if I'm in that situation where there simply aren't uh, the opportunity to get biopsies done, and I have the, the right patient and I get a liquid biopsy that shows me uh, an EGFR exon 19 deletion, I'm probably gonna go without a tissue biopsy. And I, I think I'd feel pretty good about that. 
This is a more uh, TKI related question. If a stage four non-small cell lung cancer patient is on Tegriso for 14 months and scanned mm -hmm. quarterly, does it make sense to delay the scans compared to the risk of going to an outpatient medical facility? Yeah, this is something that we're already doing. I have patients who've been scanning, you know, every 12 weeks, but they've been on treatment for 18 months or 24 months or something like that. And I'm, you know, I have no trouble moving them out um, even to six months, as long as they call me if they have any specific uh, symptoms that might suggest that things are getting worse and as long as things are well tolerated. I think uh, that is the perfect patient to potentially delay and move out because there's such low risk that something bad is going to happen quickly without uh, you knowing about it from, from the patient noticing a symptom. And I, I, sus I suspect that all of us see our patients fairly infrequently when they're doing well on a TKI. We usually probably just see them to go over the scans, mm -hmm. but I've also seen referrals where people are seen monthly and, and there's really no need for that. Um, even though scan visits can be done remotely, those are perfect for telehealth. And at the very least, having them get their scan at some local, you know, we have a lot of satellite centers where they can duck in to get a scan, and then I can call them on the, with a telemedicine visit to go over the scan without them having to come down to talk about it. Again, very often, you know, if we've been doing things every three months, uh, that's not based on some strong, strong evidence. It's based on pretty arbitrary judgments. And in this setting, moving to four to six months is, completely appropriate under the circumstances, not as your first scan time after starting someone, but in people who have been doing well and who know their, their, their symptoms, their bodies, um, just as Nate said, I mean, they should alert us if things are changing, but uh, we should feel very comfortable extending that interval between scans and visits. This is a, a follow-up to the biopsy question. Are you seeing increasing turnaround times of getting pathology results back with labs increasing COVID-19 testing with getting patients started on treatment? I haven't. No. Um, yeah, I, I actually have not seen that either. No, I, I don't think so for something like this. We haven't, we haven't, uh, we haven't seen a change. Our pathologists are, tend to be rather specialized as well. I suppose in a, in a crush where everyone got pulled to do COVID tests, perhaps things like molecular tests could, could potentially be delayed, but uh, I haven't seen that so far. No. And I think if that were the situation where molecular testing was getting delayed, going back to Stephen's point, I think this is a great opportunity to continue to, you know, test these patients, but we now thankfully have liquid biopsies and plasma-based approaches that we can use. Uh, someone wrote in about uh, would the COVID epidemic influence your choice between pembrolizumab monotherapy and pembrolizumab plus pemetrexid plus platinum, particularly for the PDL1 greater than 50% population? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, th those are, again, I, I think lateral moves until we have the results from trials comparing those regimens like in Cigna. Uh, and, you know, my sense is that I, I want to try to. Uh, delay myelosuppress or avoid myelosuppressive regimens, but I also want to keep people out of the hospital. And where uh, a prior regimen that I thought uh, might have had a, a slight edge or, or pretty comparable, but maybe a slighter risk of hospitalization for nausea or vomiting, for neutropenic fever, if I think there's an equivalent option, then I'm going to go with it. I'm relying more on aggressive anti-emetic regimens, on sort of preemptive hydration before they leave, on growth factors, everything I can do in my power to try to keep patients out of the hospital and minimize complications. And, and I agree with that, but I also would say, you know, if we're talking about carbo, pemetrex, and pembrolizumab, it's not exactly a horrifyingly challenging regimen for people. It is immunosuppressive, but I cannot recall the last time I had a patient hospitalized for neutropenic fevers on that regimen. And, uh, and I, I would just factor it in alongside other things. We, uh, we do have you know, we think about the performance status of the patient, how quickly their disease has advanced between their initial CAT scan in the ER three, four weeks ago and the PET CT, how symptomatic they've been, you know, are they losing weight between your visits or not? And, and I would say if, if I had a patient where we have reason to suspect that the chance of them progressing and missing the chance for any subsequent chemo is, is very real, um, I, I, I would certainly not, not veto chemotherapy. And I know that's not what 
Stephen's saying. I just think that I, I think it's one factor among many that should lead us to be a little more cautious than we would have been about myelosuppression. But um, but I do think that we still need to operate with the mindset that there are people who drop off the curve and may not get their chance with some of these things a second line or later. And, and that just needs to, to be factored in. Thank you so much. Um, that does appear to be all the time that we have for questions tonight. Uh, so I do wanna give a huge thank you to all the faculty that participate tonight, um, Dr. West, Dr. Pennell, Dr. Liu, and Dr. Argawal. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy practice to sit down with Enclave and all of us virtually and um, convey these obviously very pivotal discussion points um, with our audience this evening. So um, thank you to our listeners also. I truly hope you're able to gain a lot of valuable insight tonight. Um, on how clinical practice is changing uh, in oncology during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just a reminder, uh, we are planning to make these webcasts a regularly occurring series. And yes, uh, I know a couple of people wrote in about this. You will be able to listen back and watch this webcast again uh, very shortly following uh, the completion of this webinar. Um, just a reminder also, you can continue to visit Enclive.com and sign up for our e-newsletters, follow us on social media on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, you can get updates on when we'll be broadcasting more of these webinars. Um, the next one, I believe it should say on the slide, is uh, 8 p.m. Wednesday, April 1st. And um, for all of your other oncology news, you can visit Enclive.com, where you will also find our COVID-19 Resource Center. So uh, that concludes this evening's webcast. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful night. Great to connect with you guys. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye.